seventh floor. There's a strange thing that happens in the elevator, in any elevator. Every time somebody gets in, they check to see if the button for the floor they're going to is lit. And if it isn't, they push it, then face the door. That's it. They don't speak to the people already in the elevator, and the people already in the elevator don't speak to the newcomer. Those are elevator rules, I guess. No talking, no looking. Stand still, stare at the door, and wait. A guy got on, definitely older than me, but not old. Medium brown skin, slim, low haircut, part on the side, no hair on his face, none at all, not even a mustache. Gold links dangling around his neck like magic rope. Check to make sure the L button was lit, going down too. L stood for losers when we were kids. So Sean and I would stand in an empty elevator and wait for someone to get on and press L. And when they did, we would giggle because they were the loser and me and Sean were winners on a funny and victorious ride down to the lobby. I thought about this when the man with the gold chains got on and checked to see if the L button was already glowing. I wonder if he knew that in me and Sean's world, I had already chosen to be a loser. It's uncomfortable when you feel like someone is looking at you, but only when you're not looking. I've seen girls waiting at the bus stop make men pitiful pieces of putty curling backward, stretching and straining every muscle just to get a glimpse of what Sean and a lot of men around here call the world. But there were no women on this elevator, so there were no worlds to be checking for. But he kept checking anyway, not knowing that if he kept checking anyway, he'd get a world of trouble. Do I know you? I asked, irritated, freaked out. The man smiled, adjusted the chains around his neck, looked at me, straight in the eyes, dead in the face. You don't recognize me? He asked, his voice deep, familiar. I looked harder, squinted, tried to place the face. Nah, not really, I said. He smiled wide, a jagged mouth, sharp and shark-like. Then turned around so that I could see the back of his t-shirt, a silk screen photo, him squatting low, middle fingers in the air, and a smile made of triangles. R.I.P. Buck, you'll be missed forever. My stomach jumped into my chest, or my chest fell into my stomach, or both. I knew him. Buck? I stumbled. Backward. Couldn't be. Couldn't be. Ain't that what it say? He said, facing me. Couldn't be. Couldn't be. But I thought, I stared. I thought, I thought. You thought I was dead? He said, straight up. Straight up. I rubbed my eyes over and over and over and over again, tripping. Never smoked or nothing like that. Don't know high life. Don't know bad trips. Don't know dead man supposed to be talking to me, though. Yeah, I did, I said, hoping he would come back with, I'm not dead, or I faked my death, or something like that. Or maybe I'd wake up. Sit straight up in bed, the gun still tucked under my pillow, my mother still asleep at the kitchen table. A dream. Buck looked at me, noticing my panic, softly said, I am. I did all the wake-up tricks, pinched the meat in my armpit, slapped myself in the face, even tried to blink myself awake. Blink, 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 but Buck? I know what you're thinking that I was scared to death. But no need to be afraid. I had known Buck since I was a kid, the only big brother Sean had ever had. Sean knew Buck better than I did, knew Buck longer than we'd known our dad. I take it back, I was scared. What if he had come to get me, to take me with him? What if he had come to catch my breath? Anagram number one, alive equals a veil. Catching my breath, I asked, so why are you here? 
I wiped the corners of my mouth, thought, please don't say you've come to take me. Please don't say I'm dead. Please. Actually, he said, doing the bus stop lean back again. I came to check on my gun. My response. Then finally, in an almost whisper, he added, your tail is showing. I put my hand behind my back, felt the imprint of the piece like another piece of me, an extra vertebrae, some more backbone. Thought about moving it to the front, but Sean used to always say dogs, even snarling ones, tuck their tails behind their legs. A sign of fear, a signal of bluff. I remember when I gave that thing to Sean, Buck said. He was around your age. Told him he could hold it for me. Taught him how to use it too. Taught him the rules. Made him promise to put it somewhere you couldn't get it. And I replied with as much tough in my voice as I could, but I got it. And I'm glad I found it because I'm going to need it, I explained. Sean's dead now. No need to tiptoe around it. Plus, I figured Buck already knew. Figured dead, no dead stuff. Damn, dumb thing to think. Happened last night. Followed him from the store. Caught him slipping. Gave him two to the chest right outside our building. I said, anger sore in the back of my throat. But I know it was the Dark Suns. Rigs in them. Had to be. Buck folded his arms. I see, he said, shaking his head, his mouth fading into a frown. So what you about to do? My eyes turned to razor blades. I'm about to do what I gotta do, what you would have done. I squared, follow the rules. The elevator rumbled and vibrated and knocked around like the middle drawer, like something off track. Scared the hell out of me. What's taking this stupid thing so long? I asked, pounding the door as hard as my heart was pounding inside me. This rickety thing has always moved slow, Buck said, grinning. Yeah, but this is ridiculous, I replied, palms wetting. Might as well relax, Buck said. It's a long way down. Maybe he didn't hear me or didn't take me seriously. Old people always do that. Always try to act like what I'm saying ain't true. Always try to act like I'm not for real. But I was for real. So for real. Relax, I snapped. Relax? I ain't got time to relax. I got work to do, a job to do, business to handle, I said, feeling myself. My macho between my shaking legs, masking my jumping heart. Buck laughed. And laughter, when it's loud and heavy and aimed at you, I think can feel just as bad as a bullet's bang. You got work to do, a job to do, Buck teased, wiping laugh tears from his eyes. Right, right. You gonna follow the rules, huh? Yeah, that's right, I said, opening my stance to let him know this wasn't a game, that I was for real. Buck pressed his finger to my chest like he was pushing an elevator button, the L button. But you ain't got it in you, Will, he said, cocky. Your brother did, but you, you don't. He asked me if I even checked to see if the gun was loaded. I hadn't. And now, almost shot myself trying to figure out how to. Give it to me before you hurt yourself. Buck clicked something. The clip slid from the grip like a metal candy bar. Fourteen slugs, one in the hole. Fifteen total, he said, slamming the clip back in. How many should there be, I asked. Sixteen, but whatever. He held the gun out. I grabbed it, but Buck wouldn't let go. I yanked and yanked, pulled and pulled, but he resisted and resisted. Laughed and laughed, bucked and bucked. Buck finally let go, and I stumbled into the corner, slamming against the wall like a clown. You don't got it in you, he repeated over and over again under his unbreath, while sliding a pack of cigarettes from his pocket, tossed one in his mouth, struck a match that sounded like a finger snap. Then the elevator came to a stop.